Good afternoon and welcome to the first event in our Preserve the Constitution series, Supreme Court preview of the 2020 to 2021 term. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Before our program begins, we'd like to share some tips for optimizing your experience. First, we will be sharing the recording of today's program with you following the event. So if you want to watch it again, share it with a friend or jot something down from the slides, you'll have the recording to do so. Next, we want you to be a part of the conversation. Please submit your questions throughout this event in the questions box on your screen. Be sure to tell us your name, affiliation, or where you're tuning in from, and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible later on. Finally, your microphone is muted for this event. We hope you enjoy the program. The Constitution of the United States of America has endured for over two centuries. It remains the object of reverence for nearly all Americans and an object of admiration by peoples around the world. Not only is it the world's oldest national constitution still in use, it is also the shortest constitution, and therein lies its brilliance. Rather than concoct a detailed recipe covering every possible eventuality, the founders instead provided a structure and articulated a set of stable principles that provide a timeless guide for good governance that is enduring and worth preserving. This fall will mark the 11th year the Heritage Foundation has hosted our Preserve the Constitution series. By informing citizens on topics related to the Constitution and the rule of law, this annual lecture series seeks to restore the courts to their proper constitutional role and to enforce constitutional limits on government. Live events throughout September, October, and November will bring together leading voices in law and policy to give a reasoned defense for liberty. Previous events have not shied away from the big legal issues of the day, debating topics ranging from the state of the free press to the rise of the surveillance state, to attacks on religious liberty. The speakers have included some of the nation's most respected judges and legal scholars, including Justices Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh, former attorneys general Michael Mukasey, John Ashcroft, and Ed Meese, and a number of senators and congressmen. We at Heritage feel it is very important for the citizenry to have an understanding of and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. We are pleased that you are able to join us for our event today and what promises to be an engaging discussion. Following the program, we hope you will visit our website, heritage.org PTC2020, to sign up for and view additional events in our series. And now, we turn it over to our Heritage colleague to begin today's live program. Well, welcome everybody to the Heritage Foundation Supreme Court Preview. I am Giancarlo Conaparo, a legal fellow at Heritage's Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies and the co-host with my colleague, Amy Swearer of the Supreme Court related podcast, SCOTUS 101. Our preview this year is sadly overshadowed by the unexpected and tragic passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Her passing, the upcoming confirmation fight, and the implication of both of those things for this present term are doubtless front and center in most of our minds. Our two panelists today, both former Supreme Court clerks and extraordinary advocates before the High Court, will offer their thoughts on that issue and the legal issues that the court will confront this term. Among those legal issues, the scope of the Fourth Amendment, the reach of copyright law into another cutting edge area of intellectual property, the constitutionality, once again, by way of a standing fight of the Affordable Care Act, and whether the House Judiciary Committee may obtain the grand jury materials from the Mueller investigation. To discuss these issues and many others in much more detail, I have the pleasure of being joined today by the Honorable Paul Clement and Eric Citrin. If our two panelists would join us on camera, and I will introduce you both. Welcome. Uh, let me start with you, Eric. Eric is a partner at the law firm of Goldstein and Russell. After graduating from Yale Law School, he clerked for two lower court judges, both here in DC, Judge James Robertson of the District Court and Judge David Tatel of the Circuit Court. Uh, to keep things balanced, I guess, he then clerked for two Supreme Court justices, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Elena Kagan. He has served as counsel to the Attorney General in the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice 
and is a senior associate at the law firm Wilmer Hale uh, in the Supreme Court Practice Group. The Honorable Paul Clement returns to Heritage, uh, our Supreme Court preview for, I believe, the 11th time. Uh, General Clement is a partner at the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis. He is also a distinguished lecturer at Georgetown and an adjunct at NYU. After graduating from law school, he clerked for Judge Silverman, also here in the DC Circuit, and for Justice Antonin Scalia. He also served under President George W. Bush as the 43rd Solicitor General of the United States. And uh, this February, uh, that is February of this year, on the 24th, argued his 100th case before the Supreme Court. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Great to be with you. So Thanks. before we discuss uh, the cases coming up, I wondered if you would both share your thoughts about the passing of Justice Ginsburg and what her departure means for this term and for the court in the future. Eric, do you want to kick us off? Not really, but uh, I suppose I will. You know, I think it's honestly hard to to come up with the words that would be appropriate, um, you know, to say in a few minutes uh, exactly how much Justice Ginsburg has meant to the court uh, and to the people who watch it and practice and advocate there, to people like Paul and me who, you know, would have, uh, who spent a lot of time with her and, uh, so I, I'm not sure that I can can even try, but I think it I think it's safe to say that it will change a lot about the court, um, and that the you know the confirmation fight in context from 2016 it will also potentially change people's views of the court um, in ways that are difficult to predict now. Um, you know we'll have at the beginning at the outset of this term we'll have another one of these periods where. The justices uh, are missing a member and can be equally divided, and that puts a wrinkle into how some of the cases will shake out. Um, but most of all, Justice Ginsburg has been a, a really big part of how people understand uh, the membership of the court, and uh, she's been the you know a, a leader of the wing of the court, a one wing of the court, for a very long time. And losing her voice will change the voice of the court in really profound ways. Um, you know, she was a leader on some issues, like uh, a lot of federal courts, civil procedure, personal jurisdiction, um, and, uh, you know, the court will speak differently, uh, and it's um, really hard to know what, what it will sound like without her. Yeah, and, you know, I... I put together some of my thoughts in a, in a piece that uh, on SCOTUS blog. So if, you know, if anybody wants to take a look at that, they can sort of see, you know, my, my thoughts in slightly more detail. I, I will just, you know, in addition to echoing what Eric said, you know, I just highlight a couple of things. Um, you know, as, as an advocate, I really appreciated the fact that, you know, she got started as a Supreme Court advocate herself. Uh, she argued six or seven cases in front of the Supreme Court. Um, she was a very sort of tactical and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, deliberate advocate, um, you know, basically half of her cases designed to vindicate equality for women were brought on behalf of men. And, you know, I, I think she sized up the all male court she had, where some of even the liberal lions were not particularly well known for treating their female law clerks well. And, you know, she she very, I think, tactically and wisely kind of picked her picked her spots. But what I would say is, you know, as an advocate before her as a justice, what was special is that she didn't forget that she was an advocate and she didn't forget what it was like to be an advocate before the court. And so I think there was kind of a, a well of sympathy there for the advocate and the advocate's plight. She asked me plenty of hard questions uh, over the years, but not with a sharp edge. Uh, she knew the advocates' names, you know, even people who were appearing for the very first time. And she would often quote the briefs of lawyers in her opinions, which I think almost no other justice did. But, you know, if she thought you put a point well or concisely, uh, she would quote it. So that was that was impressive to me. The other thing is, 
I think she had the reputation as the justice who just wasn't going to be outworked by any of her colleagues or the lawyers in front of her. And boy, that was intimidating as an advocate because, you know, usually the only advantage you have as an advocate is that you know the record in your case better than the judges who are listening to it. I mean, they're the ones that get to ask the questions. The whole thing's sort of stacked against you. So the one thing you figure you got going for you is like you actually know where everything in the record is kind of buried or not buried. And then you got a justice who's actually looked at the whole record. Um, and she knows it as well as you did and you, as you could. Um, and it was, you know, both intimidating in its own way, but I think it caused a kind of whole generation of lawyers to work even harder uh, to prepare for argument. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, my principal interactions with Justice Ginsburg were as an advocate and, you know, occasionally socially, but I sort of kind of had my introduction to Justice Ginsburg uh, as a law clerk to Justice Scalia, because, you know, I clerked on Justice Ginsburg's first year on the court and Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were famous friends. That friendship dated back to the D.C. Circuit. And so when Justice Ginsburg arrived on the court as a new justice, Justice Scalia was plainly delighted, made crystal clear to his law clerks that, you know, not a not a bad word about Justice Ginsburg would be tolerated in chambers, but made equally crystal clear that that injunction did not extend to her draft opinions, which were totally fair game for criticism. And I think, you know, that that the nature of their friendship is something that frankly Washington needs more of. It's a friendship where the other person's on the other side of issues you care deeply about and your friendship is not some, you know, clever tactical mission to try to get them to moderate their views because you know that's hopeless. You're not going to get either Justice Ginsburg or Justice Scalia to moderate their views on something that's central and important to them, but yet you're genuinely friends. And I, I just think, you know, that used to be more common in, in, in Washington and probably in the country as a whole. And I think, you know, it's it's good at a time like this, it's a time of loss and sadness, but to hold up their friendship as a model, I think is, 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 is important. Thank you both. So we'll turn now to the heart of the issue, the uh, cases before the court. And I'd love to start uh, by discussing Torres versus Madrid. Paul, would you like to kick off the discussion? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. So this is a case that is, you know, an important Fourth Amendment case, and it's one of these cases where, you know, sometimes it, it's surprising to me that a case or an issue hasn't already been resolved. And, you know, the court's been hearing Fourth Amendment cases for an awfully long time, and the, case, the issue in the case seems both important, but one that should have probably been definitively res resolved long ago. And I think it's one where, you know, you hate in these previews to sort of predict anything because you can be famously and fabulously wrong within a month or two. But but I think this is one where the outcome's reasonably clear. So the issue in this case is essentially, is there a seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes when the suspect ultimately gets away, even though the police have shot at and indeed hit um, the suspect as they were fleeing. So, the, you know, the particular facts of this case, you know, are, you know, only important in the central feature, which is you had somebody who's approached by the police uh, under circumstances where, you know, they suspected there was some wrongdoing. The person, once they realized it was the police that was approaching, essentially tried to accelerate the, uh, a previously parked car and get away. The police officers discharged their weapons into the car. They sort of hit the driver somewhere on the driver's body, uh, but it wasn't a fatal shot or a shot that was entirely safe. The, the, the suspect essentially drove away and, you know, eventually got ended up in another state, in another car. So, you know, the question is, is there a seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes? You can see the arguments on both sides pretty clearly. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's no, there wasn't a seizure. You know, the the suspect got away and ended up in a in another state. If they were really seized, uh, you know, they wouldn't have you know ended up in New Mexico or wherever they ended up in. 
Um, but the argument on the other side, I think, is equally straightforward, which is, well, of course they were seized. I mean, it may have only been a temporary seizure. It may have been uh, a uh, sort of uh, incomplete seizure. But the idea that somebody who is, you know, you know, either implicitly or explicitly told by law enforcement to stop and then some significant degree of force is used uh, to try to stop the suspect, whether or not that's successful, there's a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty strong argument that that crosses the threshold and becomes a seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes. So that's the issue that's teed up for the court. The lower court said there wasn't a seizure here at all. Um, and, uh, you know, the court took the case. The circuits are split, but I think, you know, two things point pretty strongly to me in the direction that the court is likely to say that there is a seizure in circumstances like this. One is the simple fact that the court took the case. There was a circuit split, but I, I think the fact that the court took it in this posture with a lower court saying no seizure probably suggests that the court may be leaning in the other direction. But to me, you know, and maybe this is, comes as like a former solicitor general, but to me, the real strong signal here is even the federal government has filed a brief conceding that there was a seizure here. And, you know, next to the particular local police department that, you know, is the party in this case, the entity with the greatest incentive to argue no seizure is the SG on behalf of all federal law enforcement. And the fact that they looked hard at this case and said, you know, we should try to cut our losses rather than try to really defend the result of the court below suggests to me that, you know, that they're, they're probably a pretty good judge of where the court would be on this. So, again, I hate to make predictions, but and this will be maybe the only one I make, but I, I think the court will end up saying there's a seizure here. Eric, do you have any thoughts on Torres? I don't have too much to add. I agree with Paul that the out, this one seems like a relatively safe one to predict. I'll say, just as a general point, uh, further to um, Paul's point about the uh, brief of the United States, you know, one thing that's interesting to do in general with Supreme Court cases is to look at amicus briefs and see if you can find like the truly counterintuitive uh, amicus brief, because it, it's it's often very convincing when someone who has a dog in the fight is still nonetheless willing to say actually that they think that, uh, that they'll, they'll take the vote against their own dog, as it were. Uh, and for the, it, Paul's exactly right, the United States in almost any criminal procedure issue is always going to be on the side of law enforcement. And for them to take the opposite position really does give you a sense of how hard it would be to argue the other side of the case. Um, so I do think this one is pretty safely predicted. Uh, Eric, would you like to continue the discussion with uh, Google, Google versus Oracle? So. Uh, let me just give the audience a little a little heads up. Uh, both uh, Paul and Eric's law firms represent the two sides, so we have, uh, in a way, adverse litigants here. Yeah, I'm going to do my best not to litigate the case in this uh, setting, mostly because I feel myself unqualified to do so. Uh, I haven't played a huge role in it, and it is an extremely complex case. I'll try to give a little nutshell of it um, that gets across some of what's at stake. Um, this is a copyright case uh, that is about whether or not, uh, in large part, the declarations, which are part of Java computer language or code, uh, are copyrightable. And these declarations um, were created by uh, uh, Oracle um, Sun at the time as part of Java. And then and they were designed to be used by computer programmers uh, in making their own apps, uh, uh, applications, and, uh, and languages and the like. And, and they, um, they involve using um, often very straightforward words for commu computer commands. So, you know, something like max for find the maximum of a number or min for find the minimum of an entry or something like that. And um, when, Go when Google was uh, um, creating Android, they used a lot of these commands because they were well known to developers as part of uh, Android. And the question is, is you know, is reusing those, um, reusing something that uh, Oracle 
has the right to copyright. And then on top of that, there's also a question of whether it's fair use um, to, to reuse them in that way. And, uh, and then on top of that, the court actually layered another interesting question, which is the question of fair use was submitted to the jury in this case by agreement of the parties. And the jury found that it was a fair use. The federal circuit reversed uh, that determination, sort of reweighing a lot of the, the the many factors associated with the fair use determination for itself. And then once the case was, I think it was after it was put over for re-argument, the Supreme Court asked for further briefing on whether or not there was a Seventh Amendment issue arising from reconsidering the jury's fair use determination in this regard. Um, and so the parties have also submitted a, a set of letter briefs on whether or not there might be a Seventh Amendment problem uh, with reconsidering the jury's verdict. I think it's very hard to predict what the court is gonna do here. This is a situation where, you know, Justice Ginsburg it was long recognized as one of the major advocates for copyright protection on the court. She tended to side with the copyright holder. Um, and so just, you know, the, the loss of Justice Ginsburg's voice could have an effect in a case like this one. I think, uh, you know, the, there are billions of dollars in, at stake and a huge host of amici on both sides of it, um, you know, and, and both parties will tell you that uh, nothing less than the future of the computer programming industry is at stake. Uh, um, I will say I, one of the things that's most interesting to me is the court's interest in the Seventh Amendment issues. Um, it is a way for them to get out of deciding some very technical copyright questions to be able to say, you know, this is an issue that actually belonged to the jury. And uh, even if we might take a different view of it, courts need to, to circumscribe their review of uh, jury determinations and things like fair use. Uh, and to the extent that that might revive a Seventh Amendment constitutionalism, that would be very interesting outside the confines of just this case. But unlike uh, Torres, this is not one where I would feel very comfortable making a prediction. I think it's uh, hard to tell what the court will do. Although there is the same structural issue that Paul pointed out in Torres, this wasn't a case that the court was required to take. There isn't a circuit split or anything like that. And typically when the court takes a case from the federal circuit where there isn't a circuit split, uh, it's usually because they think they're, they at least suspect that there was something wrong in the decision below. So, but apart from that, you know, this one is, is a much more complex question. Yeah, and, and and let me just add just a couple of quick thoughts. I think Eric's done a very fair job of presenting the case, though. I tried. No, no, and, and, and you succeeded, but it is funny because, and, and I'm not directly involved in this case. I'm not in the briefs either, but I've, but I've, but I've sort of, I'm, I'm close enough to, to know that, you know, no matter how hard you try, even the language you use sort of is, you know, you know, you talk about using the code, we would say copying. Um, you know, and 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 you know, we're stealing. Um, you know, so so the, the the terminology here, it's just even the narrative of of what happened here. I mean, one thing that I think from the Oracle side of the case is kind of important to emphasize. Um, the whether it'll move the court, I don't know, but is you know they did offer these Java codes uh, to programmers under a sort of license that was a free license but that it required you, if you took the license, to then sort of have the open source sort of and, 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 and allow your own programs to be used by others, which was kind of the, the, the open source nature of the Java language. Um, and so in a situation where the, you know, the, the Google was offered a sort of, you know, a license, but didn't take it, you know, I think that's, that's an important part of the narrative from sort of the other side of the case. Again, whether any of that moves the court or not, I think, you know, time will tell. As Eric says, you know, it's, you think about the Seventh Amendment issue, the court added, you know, I, I've sort of my views about what, you know, what's right or wrong on that, but it's certainly, I think, going to be easier for the justices yeah. to feel comfortable that they got their hands around the Seventh Amendment than that they have their hands around some of the technology, which is, which is pretty sophisticated. And then as Eric alluded to, you got these amicus briefs and, you know, there, there's an enormous number of amicus briefs on both sides, you know, from people, you know, including from experts who purport to know all of the details, yet they don't really agree. So it's, it's a daunting kind of, you know, set of issues for the court. 
Um, and just to underscore one thing Eric said, um, you know, what's what's interesting to me about this case is had a long and tortured uh, history. It's been up to the Supreme Court in an earlier iteration, uh, two different times at the earlier stage and at this stage, the court called for the views of the Solicitor General. Uh, you know, the Solicitor General um, at at both stages in different solicitor generals of different parties. So, you know, Don Verrilli and Noel Francisco, the case has been around long enough. They both said that, you know, the court shouldn't take the case um, or didn't need to take the case. And, you know, the court, you know, this time around took the case, notwithstanding all of that. So I think Eric's right. The court's, you know, the court's very interested in this issue. And and I guess, you know, I think we'll, once we get the decision at the end of the day, I think we'll we'll find out whether it's because they really think the federal circuit got it wrong or whether they think that the stakes in this case are just so enormous that, you know, it really was a case that kind of merited their attention. I think that, you know, that'll be that'll be what we'll find out at the end of the case. Yeah, I will say also the fair use issue is probably uh, also easier for the court to wrap its head around. I think it's just it doesn't require the technical knowledge and an understanding of you know, how to think about computer programming language. And I do agree with Paul, like the problems of the case tend to be terminological or epistemological, you know, and and, rap, and and involve questions that ordinary judicial philosophy don't doesn't read on to very well. Well, before we uh, launch into the Affordable Care Act cases, I just want to remind the audience that if you would like to submit questions uh, on your dashboard uh, on the right side of your screen, there's a, a box where you can do that. So without further ado, we've got a pair of cases, Texas versus California, California versus Texas. Uh, Paul, can you give us the overview of the the latest uh, journey of the Affordable Care Act to the Supreme Court? Sure, I'm happy to. You know, you have to, you can't tell the, the tale of this case without starting with NFIB against Sebelius, which is a case that I was, you know, personally involved in. I represented the 26 states challenging the statute. A real focal point of the challenge in that case was the individual mandate. At the time, the individual mandate was backed up with a substantial penalty that was framed as a tax penalty. Um, and so, you know, that it, at the time, the individual mandate was a real focus of the litigation because it was, at least we argued, unprecedented, but also it was, you know, it was onerous. It put a real obligation on people to you know either purchase uh, qualifying health insurance or pay a substantial penalty, and that was really a focus of or what we said was constitutionally excessive. Uh, the court issued an opinion um, that sort of you know famously, uh, at least if you look at the chief justice's opinion, said you know we get we got three issues on the mandate: is it a valid exercise of the commerce power? Is it a valid exercise of the necessary and proper power? Is it a valid exercise of the taxing power? I think it's fair to say that much of the focus of the litigation was on the commerce power. Uh, in deciding the case, the court in the context uh, started by saying, this is not a valid exercise of the commerce power. Uh, a lot of court watchers, indeed some reporters said, oh, the Affordable Care Act is gonna be struck down. It's not with the, the commerce power. The chief then said, it's not a valid exercise of the necessary and proper power. Even more reporters filed stories saying the whole story, the whole thing's going. And then at the end, he said, but it's OK under the taxing power uh, because, you know, it's not principally how it was marketed, even by the president. Uh, but it did have the capacity to raise revenue. So it's a valid exercise of the of, of the the uh, taxing power. The four dissenting justices rejected that argument and went so far as to say that the mandate was unconstitutional. And without the mandate, the other provisions in the statute couldn't work as intended, so the whole statute had to fall. So fast forward to 2017, um, Congress, after several attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act in full, because by this point, at least the House has flipped over to Republican control, after several failed efforts to repeal the whole thing, they do get a piece of legislation that's passed that has the effect of zeroing out the tax penalty. So there's still a mandate in the statute and still theoretically backed by sort of, you know, some kind of tax penalty, but the tax penalty is essentially zero. So there, so it, it, I think in fairness, no longer has the capacity to raise revenue. 
So somebody has, you know, the clever idea that to say, um, well, wait a second, this thing was only constitutional because of the taxing power. It's now been amended in a way that the mandate no longer raises revenue. So it's no longer constitutional. And then for good measure, just as the dissenter said back in the day, without the individual mandate, uh, the whole statute has to fall. So the district court essentially accepted those arguments. Um, the case has gone up to the Fifth Circuit. The court took the case um, in a posture where it didn't absolutely have to. It could have, you know, the Fifth Circuit remanded and the court could have left the case alone, but they took the case. So it's squarely in front of them. And I think the two issues in the case are, you know, is the individual mandate that no longer raises revenue still a valid exercise of taxing power? And if not, what are the effects on the uh, on, on on the on, on the rest of the statute? So I'll also have some standing arguments and other things kicking around in the case, but I'm just going to focus on those two in the interest of time. Um, I think you know the the, the argument on the merits, um, you know, is 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 going to be a close one, and you know, and a change in the court's membership could be outcome determinative on that issue. I don't know, uh, but I think that. Even if the court were to say that the individual mandate in its current form uh, no longer has the capacity to raise revenue, so it's no longer a tax, I would personally be a little surprised if the court, even with a new member, ends up translating that into a ruling that the whole statute falls as unconstitutional. I'm not going to predict that, but I just I would say, and want to highlight and it's the last thing I'll say on this is. The severability argument now is very different from what it was back in 2011 when I argued the case. I think the simplistic version of this case is, well, four justices back in you know 2011 were ready to strike down the whole statute if the mandate fell. But now, um, and now if they get a fifth vote, the whole thing goes. But the, but I, there is a real difference, and you know you know there's a couple of differences, but the two I'd highlight is, you know. Severability analysis is ultimately an inquiry into legislative intent. And back in 2011, you could make a pretty good argument. I'd like to think I'm, you know, I made it, so I'd like to think it was a pretty good argument. We can make a pretty good argument that at that point, the mandate that was backed by a real penalty was critical to the whole statute because a couple of states had tried guaranteed issue and other things without a mandate and they hadn't succeeded. So you could you could make that argument. In, two, in 2017, after Congress tries to repeal the whole thing and fails, and then passes a statute that allows the statute to continue without a really enforceable mandate, to then argue that Congress would have preferred a stat no statute to a statute without the mandate, I, I think is a much harder argument and a much different argument. The second thing I would say is we had a couple of term cases from last term on severability. And they're certainly distinguishable, but neither of them, I think, provides a lot of comfort for the argument that the statute is non-severable. Both of those cases, the Cilia Law case and the Bar Against AAPC case, you know, have, you know, you know, multiple members of the court you'd sort of have to get to get to a non-severability holding, uh, basically, you know, being pretty skeptical that, you know, the whole statute should fall and kind of erring on the side of preserving what you can of a statute, even if a particular provision is unconstitutional. But I think I'm almost, you know, more more interested in how the severability argument plays out than the merits argument. Both are interesting, and uh, you know, it's certainly a case worth watching. You have any thoughts to add, Eric? I'll try. Although I think I'm in broad agreement with Paul, especially about the severability issue. Um, being where the rubber hits the road on the effects of the litigation and that it's a it's a much harder sell this time around. Um, you know, I'll say the standing issue is also a serious one for the um, for the I don't know if it's the petitioners, but it's the for the states who are complaining. You know, the, the easiest way to describe this case about the layperson is to the layperson is people are up in arms about the mandate. They think the mandate is problematic and that it hurts them. And the mandate has been set to zero. So it is not exactly clear what you're complaining about anymore. And to the extent that standing doctrine has a purpose, it is to ensure that the 
plaintiffs in the suit have something that really injures them that they are complaining about. Now, they have more complex arguments about how the Rube Goldberg machine of the statute still hurts them and maybe hurts them worse once the mandate is set to zero. But it is important to bear in mind that, you know, this is a complaint about the mandate and it becomes difficult that you have to build the Rube Goldberg machine uh, as a legal argument in order to have an understanding for why it's bad the mandate was set to zero. And that's it. then that kind of bleeds into the severability point. Uh, one way that I describe it is slightly differently from the way Paul had, but I think to the same effect is, you know, um, when Obamacare was passed or the ACA was passed, it was safe to call it a statute, you know, but and now what you have are two different acts of Congress, actually. You know, one that was passed uh, as the ACA uh, by one Congress and then an amendment that was passed by a different Congress. And if you think that this amendment has an unconstitutional effect, the most natural thing to do would be to strike down the amendment as unconstitutional, not to reach back and strike down a whole other act of Congress based on something that a different Congress had done to it. Uh, now, if Congress had gone ahead and said out loud, you know, you have to consider this whole thing together, we're amending the ACA and we don't want the ACA absent this kind of change, then maybe you'd have an argument for non-severability, but it's very hard to read one of the acts of Congress back into the other one, I think. Um, and so both of those, I think, will be major hurdles, uh, even with a new member on the court. Um, but, I, you know, it will be interesting also for constitutional law more broadly what they do with the merits question. Uh, given the different composition. Eric, will you continue and talk about Fulton versus Philadelphia? Sure. So um, this is a case um, in a family of cases that the court has been more interested in over the last five years, I would say, about um, uh, religious liberty uh, and um, I guess more broadly, I would talk, say it's it's a case about reconciling um, generic uh, or general um, laws that have an effect on people with a religious practice with the desire to make some accommodation for people's religious views so that they can play the role they want to play or, or participate in civic life according to these general laws while also abiding by their faith. So the question in this case has to do with Catholic Social Services, which for a very long time um, has served the city of Philadelphia by helping them to place children in foster care. Um, the the, the um, city's brief calls them a point of light in the process. They obviously have been uh, major contributors to the program. But a couple of years ago, uh, Philadelphia has a non-discrimination requirement um, that, involve, that includes couples who are same sex and Catholic Social Services said that they can't, uh, it's not consistent with their uh, sincerely held religious beliefs to certify that um, uh, you know, a same sex family would be a good um, place to place children in foster care. And they wanted to continue to participate in the program notwithstanding their ability, inability to, to make that certification. The city said that they would not permit that and the, the resulting fight is over whether or not the constitution permits them um, to get essentially an exemption from that non-discrimination requirement in order to um, comply with the free exercise requirements uh, of the constitution. Um, the one interesting um, thing to know about this case, if you haven't followed the issues closely, is you know the big decision that governs this is one that was written by Justice Scalia, uh, Employment Division against Smith, which stands you know, pretty broadly for the proposition that laws of general application that have a, a greater effect on people because of their religious views and may even you know, prevent people from complying with their sincerely held religious beliefs are nonetheless permissible. Um, and you don't get an exemption typically from a law of general application based on your uh, religious views. They, the, um, the, uh, Catholic Social Services has asked uh, to reconsider that decision as part of this litigation, and that question has been granted. And so it is possible that the court could change the regime. That makes it harder to anticipate what will happen in a case like this one and whether the court will change uh, the regime. 
it's interesting that Justice Scalia, who of course is a friend, I think, of, of religious liberty generally and of pluralism, is the author of that opinion. And uh, when, the, when the rubber hits the road on that issue, it's, it can be hard to predict where people will come down. I will say this is another one of those cases where um, it's almost frustrating to see this arising in the courts because one would think that in a pluralistic society, there is a way to accommodate people who you think are points of light and want to do good in the world without making a big issue of them needing a narrow exemption from it. Uh, and unlike in um, some of the cases that have arisen in the past, you know, there doesn't seem to be any argument that a same-sex couple couldn't get this service very easily from the city by using somebody other than Catholic Social Services to come and do a home visit. Um, and so, you know, I think this case will will create the the fight that you've been seeing on the court between um, uh, those who are really concerned that we're making special exemptions for religious actors and and others including people, I think, on both sides of the aisle. You know, Justice Kagan, I think, is a pretty broad advocate for religious pluralism generally, who think, you know, we should have, a, our fundamental constitutional value should be pluralism. Uh, and maybe there should be a way to reconcile what the city is trying to do and what Catholic Social Services wants to do. Do you have any thoughts to add, Paul? So I'll, I'll just, you know, frame the case, uh, you, know, in, you know, in a second, but I, I would just want to pick up where Eric left off because, you know, I, I do think that there are sort of two big potential issues here that the court could really, you know, decide a blockbuster. You know, one would be to overrule Smith or to not overrule Smith definitively and to keep it in place. That would be big. Um, you know, the other thing, and I think this is where Eric started, you know, there's this lurking issue that the court wrestled with in the Masterpiece Cake Shop and only got more important because of the Bostock decision about how do you reconcile sort of religious liberty claims with non-discrimination provisions that require non-discriminations on bases that are kind of core teachings of, you know, religions. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's a collision course coming and the court's gonna have to resolve it one way or another, and they could do it in this case. But even though there are those two big issues here, I think what Eric said at the end is kind of, you know, my instinct is, you know, the facts of this case may matter a lot, and there are a lot of exit ramps for the court to decide this case without deciding either of those blockbuster issues. And I think just the details of the way this program worked may make a big difference. And what Eric, you know, I think highlighted, but I'll just, you know, reinforce is that, you know, this would be, I think, an easier case for the city, a harder case for the challengers, if, if this were set up in a way that the only way for a foster you know, couple to get certified was to go through the CSS, the Catholic Social Services, and they refused to do it on religious grounds. You know, that would really, I think, make the court confront the hard questions. But the way that this program works, at least as I understand it, is if you're a couple, you know, there's, there's like something like two dozen organizations that can certify you. So if CSS won't do it, you can go to a secular organization and they'll do the home visit and they'll certify you. And then you can be a foster you know, parent that way. And those kind of, you know, and I may be, you know, I'm not directly involved in the case, so I may be misunderstanding some of the details of that. But I think, you know, actually it's in those details where the case may be fought and, you know, there may be a way for the court to rule in favor of the Catholic social services who lost below, but without really, you know, deciding any of these um, you know, kind of blockbuster issues. There's probably a greater chance that they do that if, you know, they try to decide this court, this case with just eight justices, because, you know, historically when they've had that phenomenon, they try to go for the narrower, the narrower route. The, the only other thing I just wanted to say is the broader framing is, you know, if you, if you look back at last term, you know, there were a number of cases where a lot of court watchers might have thought that, you know, relatively conservative court would come up with a relatively conservative result and didn't. June Medical, Bostock, the Dreamers case. And, you know, the one thing that kind of made last term, um, you know, not a complete disaster from the perspective of, say, Justice Alito, uh, was the religious liberty cases. There were three religious liberty cases that all came out in favor of the, the claimant for religious liberty. And, you know, I, I just say that as a kind of a backdrop for this case, because, I, you know, I do think there are some issues 
where you know just Chief Justice Roberts or Justice Gorsuch has a you know distinct view where they kind of peel off from some of their their fellow uh, conservative justices. But I don't really think religious liberty is one of those issues. You know, as Eric highlights, Smith is tricky um, because it was written by Justice Scalia. But on some of the kind of core issues, I do think there's a real kind of commitment to religious liberty on a kind of a working majority of the court. I will say, I want to add just one thing, which I forgot to raise, which is there is a narrow way that this could come out in favor of the city as well, which is, you know, the city says, look, we're not regulating CSS's conduct at all. This is basically a service they provide for the city and as an agent for the city and that, you know, a much lower standard should apply in that circumstance. I do think this is an example of where what Paul was just saying um, is important to bear in mind. That's like a conceptual framing that I think the advocates of religious liberty on the court are just very unlikely to accept. It's too important to Catholic Social Services conception of what it does and the, the role that it serves in the community and as an institution to treat this as like, oh, you know, you're, they're, they're just like a, an agent of the city here. But as a formal legal matter, that argument may be good. Um, and so I don't know if that will attract attention either. Um, but I, I do agree that you have to bear in mind, I think, the, the, the frame, the social frame that uh, a, a large, an increasingly large number of the justices bring to this particular issue, trying to figure out how it's going to come out. In the interest of time, if you both don't mind, I thought we'll skip ahead to DOJ versus House Judiciary so that we've uh, saved some time for questions. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, so, Eric, would you kick off the discussion about uh, House Judiciary? Sure. So this is the case about the redacted portions of, uh, I guess it's, uh, I step back, the House uh, Judiciary Committee was seeking the materials um, from the grand jury associated with the Mueller investigation. And uh, the question, uh, and in order to get them, the, the court has to, you, you can only get them from the court. The, uh, oversees the grand jury, the court was going to release them, the DOJ appealed, uh, and the DC Circuit in a split decision said um, that those materials could be released. The rule allows releasing them in connection with a judicial proceeding. And so the actual legal question that uh, boils out of this highly political controversy is whether impeachment is a judicial proceeding for purposes of federal rule of criminal procedure 6E, um, uh, which would allow the court to release them uh, in this circumstance. Uh, that question actually, it's not clear, did divide the DC Circuit. So Judge Rogers, um, who wrote the DC Circuit's opinion, said it is a judicial proceeding. Judge Griffith voted with her uh, for that position. And Judge Rao, who is a Trump appointee uh, um, and one of the newer members of the DC Circuit, uh, she distinguished between um, whether the materials, whether the court could permit the materials to be released or would actually be mandating their release, uh, but didn't actually question whether um, impeachment qualifies as a judicial proceeding. The government petitioned and did get a stay of this order in order to bring this petition on the theory that it's not a judicial proceeding, and that's the argument that they've been making. Um, the uh, House Judiciary Committee's merits brief it hasn't actually even been filed yet. This case is slated for argument in December. Uh, Judge Rao did make the interesting point in the D.C. Circuit that, you know, whether or not this is a judicial proceeding, it does seem to be over. Uh, and uh, it's not exactly clear what we're doing here anymore. Uh, the D.C. Circuit's response to that, the majority's response to that was, you know, that the House could um, always bring new articles of impeachment and uh, release preliminary to a possible judicial proceeding has been viewed as a uh, release in connection with a judicial proceeding for purposes of the rule in the past. Um, that will become an even more extraordinary lift if, you know, Trump has um, not been reelected in November. So I, I don't know what is going to happen to this case when it's heard in December, um, but it does seem to be an important enough issue that the court may want to reach it, notwithstanding the fact that it may no longer be ripe. On the other hand, if the court doesn't have to reach it. Often the court doesn't like, like to uh, decide controversial issues like that if it can avoid them. 
Um, again, I think it's a little hard to predict what's going to happen in this case. The courts taking it seems to indicate that they think there may be a mistake. At the same time, you know, um, it, I think it's fair to say I don't, I, you know, I don't want to give a slanted appraisal of the case. I think it's fair to say that historical practice does seem to have treated this as a relatively ordinary way of of treating um, grand jury materials that they can be released to Congress in connection with this kind of investigation. Uh, so it would be a change to uh, to reach the opposite result. I, th I think the court is gonna be hesitant to do that. Um, but uh, again, I think it's hard to predict. What are your thoughts, Paul? Um, you know, I'm, I, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll just, you know, basically say, I think Eric summarized the case well, but I think he's right to kind of highlight the kind of, it's either constructively moot or it's moot. Um, and, you know, maybe the court will, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked um, and maybe it depends on, you know, what happens in November, but I wouldn't be shocked if the court ultimately doesn't issue a definitive decision on this. You know, if you look at something like the the Mazars case from last term involving financial records, you know, the court is not super anxious to set down definitive rules in these kind of areas that definitively tip the balance in favor of the executive branch and the legislative branch. It's almost like you know, they want to keep everybody guessing so everybody has an incentive to compromise. Well, let me uh, introduce some of our audience questions. Um, I'll start here. How do you think uh, the Supreme Court vacancy will, if at all, affect the court's docket? And could we see a new justice participating uh, if they were or confirmed relatively quickly? So, I mean, I'll just jump in, Eric, to start and say, you know, look, one way it affects the court's docket in a way that, you know, Supreme Court advocates are going to feel immediately is that, you know, the court is, you know, you know, in the, in the end of September, right before the first Monday in October, you know, it traditionally comes back and they look at, you know, the, what they call the long conference. And it's long because the, all these cert petitions have collected over the summer when they don't dispose of them in a regular order. And so all these cert petitions are waiting for them. And, uh, you know, you need four votes to get cert granted. And any way you slice it, you know, it's harder to get four out of eight than it is four out of nine. Um, so, you know, every single cert petition, just, you know, it's road to getting granted just got steeper. So one way this is gonna affect the docket in, you know, and just, you know, the most straightforward way is, you know, the court is not gonna probably grant as many cases out of the long conference as it would have with a full court. And that's gonna have some carryover effects. And you know, I think the docket will be a little thinner in you know, January and February than it would have been with a full court. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, what the court does can be overread a lot, but I think it is fair to say that around the other confirmations and vacancies, the court certainly slowed the pace of grants uh, particularly in some of the more controversial cases. I think the chief has an instinct to try to uh, to maintain uh, a relatively depoliticized air for the court when it, when he can. I think you know it's, it would be hard to bring on a new person um, and you know immediately throw them into some of the biggest political controversies of the day. So my guess is that the court will, again, have a, a somewhat boring docket for a little while. Uh, they'll be, let's just say they'll be in search of uh, bankruptcy cases where there's a, a shallow circuit split and the like, uh, so that they can direct their attention elsewhere for a little while. But, you know, it's not really the chief's decision to control. If there are four justices for any case, uh, then they can grant. And uh, um, if whoever the nominee is, you know, is is interested in getting those cases right away, then, you know, that, that vote uh, could change the cert docket a lot. I will say a shift in the ideological balance of the court, it's important to realize that that can shift the um, the cert granting a lot. You know, the, the court's shadow docket may be more responsive to its ideolog ideological shift than even some of the merits outcomes. Uh, and so what cases get granted and what don't, where when there are stays, that can all be affected a lot by the presence of a vote that's very different from the one that had been there before. Yeah, and, and just to underscore that, I mean, you know, you really saw this 
I mean, you know, when, when there was that period of time where it seemed like, you know, you might get Merrick Garland as the new justice, you know, there were a lot of kind of, you know, liberal public interest groups that were dusting off kind of theories and claims and arguments, you know, or, you know, that they had kind of long kept in, you know, in, in, in cold storage. And at the same time, there were more conservative legal groups, you know, going into a deep defensive crouch to try to keep, keep cases away from the Supreme Court. And, you know, you know, when you have a change in personnel and a perception that the court's more conservative and more liberal, it not only affects like what the court does with their cert docket, but it affects what cases litigants want to, you know, bring and who's playing offense and who's playing defense. So that's where, you know, in the longer term, you'll really see a big impact, I think, on the nature of the court's docket. Another question, does the Religious Freedom of Restoration Act uh, play a role in Fulton? Well, I think the short answer is no, because RIFRA only controls federal action. Uh, that was decided in Bernie, uh, a case um, uh, from the late 90s, uh, where the court held that the effort to extend that RIFRA's uh, you know, rehabilitation of the strict scrutiny uh, standard for these questions couldn't be extended to the states and would only control the federal government. And uh, in fact, Justice Scalia has a concurrence in Bernie where he defends uh, the rule from Smith that also features heavily in, in that portion of uh, Fulton where the, where the sides are fighting about whether to keep Smith or not. And so I guess the short answer to the question is no. Yeah, and, and, and the only way it figures, you know, Eric's short answer is exactly right. As a doctrinal matter, it doesn't figure directly. The one place it kind of, you know, plays a sort of a cameo, though, is, you know, one is, is on the question of whether to overrule Smith. Because one of the points that Justice Scalia made back in Smith was that the kind of, you know, the rule of Smith, that laws of gen general applicability don't trigger any kind of heightened scrutiny is, you know, more administrable. And this, you know, the, the heightened scrutiny cases are unadministrable. And, you know, with RIFRA having applied to the federal government for nearly 20 years now, or 30 years almost now, and the, you know, the Supreme Court itself having had a couple of RIFRA cases and, you know, sort of been able to administer it. You know, one of the arguments the Catholic Social Services makes is, you know, the administrability question has changed since 1991, and RIFRA and a related statute that can apply to the states in certain circumstances, RLUPA, have shown us that that kind of heightened scrutiny standard is administrable. So that's the one way it sort of plays a cameo, but as a direct doctrinal matter, uh, Eric's exactly right. And our final question uh, for the day, the tax reform, um, the bill that uh, eliminated the uh, tax with respect to the uh, mandate in the Affordable Care Act, uh, was done through budget reconciliation, implying that the mandate could be the mandate zeroing out could be reversed by simple majority. Does that have any impact on the arguments in the case? I, I don't see it having a big impact on 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 the case. I mean, you know, that may sort of play in the, in the backdrop, and certainly there may be an argument that you know the tax isn't really zeroed out because it could pop back in, kind of, you know. Uh, sort of easily, and I think there's some related arguments that have been made that, you know, because of the way the Congress did it, they, you know, they didn't completely change the sort of infrastructure that still makes it a tax. You know, those are those are all, you know, hard, you know, hard arguments. So I, I, I kind of, you know, I don't know. I mean, either the court's going to have a reaction that this is sort of a feigned controversy because, you know, it's a complaint about a mandate that doesn't isn't really backed up with an obvious penalty, or it's going to have sort of the, you know, sense that, no, this is a really big deal because of the severability argument, which is why I kind of think at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the focus will be, end up being on severability because it's part of the answer to why does this matter? Um, you know, is, you know, well, you know, obviously it matters if it means the whole statute were to be unconstitutional. So I, 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 I think those details, you know, they may, they may matter just a little bit, but I don't think that's where the action is. Yeah, there's sort of a cute argument that says, you know, well, you know, you, you made this part of a tax reform bill uh, in order to get it into the reconciliation progress. 
process, doesn't that prove that this is taxing legislation? Uh, but that is that you know that, that is cute. It's a good debater's point. It isn't the sort of thing that controls what the, what the justices are going to decide. Um, well, gentlemen, I want to thank you both so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, for our audience members, uh, I guess our panelists won't hear a round of applause, but uh, know that uh, you have my gratitude and our gratitude. Uh, there is a handout for anyone who wants to learn more about the cases we discussed today, available on the handouts tab. And as the term starts, uh, the podcast that Amy and I run, SCOTUS 101, will be covering uh, the Supreme Court every week. Thank you, gentlemen, again.